Most importantly, we wanted to share with you today how specifically the common core standards are being implemented in our classrooms with our students right here in Lake County, Florida. So our agenda this morning includes Katie Stevens, the Common Core Communications Director from the Florida Department of Education, Jan Tobias, our Director of Student Services, and she will share a little bit about student data collection here at the local level. We have three stellar teachers representing the elementary, middle, and high school levels to talk about implement implementation of Common Core and college and career readiness in their classrooms. We have April Juan Nasty from Tiberius Elementary School, Kelly Cousineau from East Ridge Middle School, and Andrea Pyatt from Mount Dora High School and now a program specialist in academic services. We want to also make sure that we provide time for questions and answers so our academic teams here can provide any information that you might have as it relates to academic practices being utilized right here in Lake County. We have some elected officials in the audience with us today, and I'd like to recognize them as, as they are in the audience. We have Representative Larry Metz. Welcome, Larry Metz. There's been a lot of discussion about the terminology 
called Common Core Spirit. <coughs> There's much concern and apprehension by all people. But before we draw a conclusion on that, that the standards are incorrect, we have to analyze some other factors that are involved in our system. Because in 2007, when the next generation sometimes these standards appeared, we also introduced a new differentiated accountability system that came along with greater accountability. In fact, since that time, we've had about 39 changes to our grading formula and um, grading system. That's a lot of change in a short amount of time. And changes in classroom implementation were a starting point in which things were much more prescriptive. High stakes testing took on a new meaning as performance assessments for teachers were legislated. And all of this creates common core. Those were some things that were already in place. It's just now that common core standards are now replacing the next generation. So yes, there are many concerns and we all share those. I share some of the same concerns you do about the high stakes tests that are being developed and designed. What do they look like are some of the questions we're asking. Is there time to appropriate validate them? Do we have the technological infrastructure to implement all of this? What is it going to cost? Those are all the questions that we are wrapping our arms around or trying to wrap our arms around. But these are all the factors that come into play. These discussions are so important for us to have today with all of you on a continual basis as we walk through these times together as a community with two-way communication so that we can share what we know and understand in a transparent manner and to listen to your concerns, your ideas, your suggestions, all with an open mind. Again, I want to personally thank you for taking your time. This is the second forum we've uh, conducted. We've been trying to do them in areas around um, Lake County. The next forum that we host will be in the evening and it will be centrally located because we want to make sure that everyone in our community, parents, um, community members, retirees, and business people at large have an opportunity to attend and ask questions. We do have Representative Larry Metz here, and I know that he goes to represent Lake County in an outstanding way in Tallahassee. And as legislators, they deal with a lot of these topics that you and I are also um, addressing. <coughs> I wanted to afford uh, Representative Metz a few minutes if he wanted to make any comments. And then we'll welcome Casey. Thank you very much, Dr. Monster. I appreciate it. I was not part of the program today. I'm not here to really present any information. I'm here to gain information. I was the one in Claremont, and I'm really happy to be here today. And I want to thank everybody for being here this early uh, to learn about the Common Core State Standards. Um, I want to just mention to you a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the Common Core Standards were passed into law in 2010. I wasn't in the legislature then, so I didn't have the opportunity to learn about it. As a legislator, I was on the school board actually, and we heard about it after, after it was passed. I think these forms are a very good idea. This is actually American democracy in action, really, when we think about it. We're talking about changing the standards for our education system, and we're having public forums, and we're vetting this information now. My only regret is that we didn't do this four years ago before it was actually passing the law. But it's not too late to do this, and so I think it's a healthy exercise for us to do this. And I think the most important thing for me right now, going into the 2014 legislative session, which is months away, we have plenty of time to do this, uh, but the most important challenge is to separate fact and fiction. We don't want to make decisions based on uh, fictional concerns or, or anything like that. We want to make sure that we get facts straight about this. And that's very important to me. And I think one of the fundamental principles that I'm going to be looking for is whether or not local school boards still have the ability to do their jobs uh, locally and not be told by Washington or Tallahassee exactly what they must do in every respect if that's not the proper way to go. We have elected school boards for a reason. Uh, but it is important to think that we understand what our standards are and what they evolve with time. And the one thing about the Common Core that I've learned so far is that the objective of it seems to be to try to enhance critical thinking skills of students rather than continue with the traditional model of memorization and regurgitation. And I remember memorization and regurgitation from when I was a student myself, and I used to question at the time, is this really going to be helpful to memorize things like the periodic table? Well, now that we have technology where you can carry a personal computer in your pocket, literally, it's called a mobile phone or a smartphone, but it's a computer, we have a different world that we live in. So 
it's important that we understand this and get this right. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, some of the things I've heard, I, I want to make sure that we don't uh, go with something that's not correct. I heard, for example, in an email, I saw an email that this common four state standards would prevent teaching of the founding documents. Now that was shocking to see someone uh, represent that that would be the case. But I know for a fact that we have a state law in place that requires that we teach these things. So I'm, I'm just pointing out that we need to make sure we understand, separate fact and fiction, and make sure we have the facts before we make any decisions. Because I would not support any standards that said we would not teach the founding documents in the school, as one example. Um, so finally, I want to say one other thing that is, a few weeks ago, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President of the Florida Senate sent a letter to then Commissioner Bennett about the park assessment, which is the assessment piece of the town floor. And they requested that we withdraw from the park. So that's going to be something that we're going to be dealing with in the legislative session. I'll just put that out there for you to think about. Uh, the park assessment uh, is a consortium type assessment tool. And basically, how it's administered and when it's administered and the cost of administering it are all great concerns to our legislative leaders. So I expect that we're going to have uh, something to do with that in 2014, dealing with the park assessment and also reviewing and, and deciding on the uh, continuation of Common Core. So a lot of these things are on the table, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to learning more about this. Thank you, Dr. Marks. I appreciate it.
representatives from groups, including Harvard University, were all engaged in the process of these and interviewed and on development committees. So we really, truly have a really thorough um, representation of what's needed to be successful at, at all levels. In Florida, the Common Core, um, we have five people <coughs> who are involved in the development. One Volusia County educator, a professor from the University of Florida, a professor from Florida State, and two DOE uh, staffers who are both still there, um, who are involved in the development of the standards. So they helped write the standards, review the standards, and they were involved in the process. The standards themselves were adopted by our state board in 2010. There was a review committee established, and um, that review committee included outside educators from outside the department. Um, from around the state, um, parents and other community members who were involved, they um, reviewed them to see if the Common Core standards were as strong as our math and ELA standards under Next Generation Sunshine State standards and they found that they were stronger than and did not recommend any supplemental standards to the Common Core. Not that um, there are a few uh, changes with uh, student expectations in the Common Core. Um, we know, as, as you can see here, um, these are skills that we use every day in our jobs. There's peer collaboration, there's higher order critical thinking, there's um, conceptual understanding. So it's not just I know that two plus two is four, it's I know why two plus two is four, how that adds together, how it's applicable in the real world. So we may not only do two plus two in number four, but we know if we have two apples here and two apples there, we have four apples. And we might need four apples to bake an apple pie or something like that. So it, it's applied into skills they'll use in their real um, and then also it focuses on transferring skills into new experiences. So what you learn in English or what you learn in math can also be applied in science or also can be applied in social studies. It's not unique just to one content area. So um, moving into some changes and what you'll hear more from from our wonderful educators. Um, we're going to um, Make some shifts in the classroom. Um, a few things uh, you'll see is we'll get away from the traditional model that I'm doing now of standing in front of the group and kind of disseminating information, and we'll turn it into what we refer to often as a reverse classroom, where one of the educators may pose a question, and the students will have to collaborate among their peers, research their books, go online to find the answer, collaborate and report back and provide evidence for their reasoning for their answer. So it's much more engaging. It's much um, more rigorous for the student to learn. And um, you'll also see some, some things uh, called thematic units where groups of teachers may get together and cover one subject but in all different content areas to reinforce what you're learning in the other also, uh, educators will have to become more knowledgeable about their content area. And a lot of times we see in secondary, if you're a social studies teacher, you have really strong depth of knowledge about social studies. You may not be as familiar with science. Or if you're in elementary, you may have a pretty good basic understanding of everything um, because you have to teach all the subjects. But the time we are going to require educators to really dig deeper and no content area because they have to make sure their students really understand it. Um, we're going to moving on. Um, once again, the, we'll take the, the standards are the what? So the, the knowledge and the skills. And then we move to the curriculum instruction, which is handled and stored at the local level. And those are the materials and methods used in the class. So the standards say a student should be able to know how to do this, or they should be able to have this skill. And your educators are the ones who are deciding, okay, well, we're going to utilize this book, or we're going to do a lab for this, or this activity for that, and I'm going to teach it in this way. And that's decided at the district level, 
And the nice thing about these standards is, is that because of that, our educators have more flexibility in their classrooms. Um, we look here at a few uh, highlights of the standards, focus, coherence, rigor, and we look at that there are fewer standards here. Typically, there could be upwards of 100 standards for an educator to cover in one year. With Common Core, there's between 25 and 30, give or take, and you can look at them and you can see that the Common Core standards dig deep. They require a lot of mastery, and because of that, that allows our educators to have more flexibility to focus on making sure the students are mastering those skills and that knowledge, and they can differentiate their instruction to meet the needs of their students better because they don't have even more to cover. It's, so we're going to move away from Monday through Friday, we're studying this. Monday you learn it, Friday you take a test, new subject on next Monday. It's going to be several weeks and they're going to be focused on mastering multiple standards over the, those weeks, but they're going to have mastered them and they're going to have really strong understanding of their knowledge and their skills. So there are eight mathematical practices and, um, associated with this and it focuses on perseverance and things like that. So you don't just get the wrong answer and you give up. You keep working through it. Um, one of the greatest benefits to these standards is that we're going to see students struggle a little in the classroom, but that's because they're building strong critical thinking and problem solving skills which they need um, post-graduation. Um, so a few examples of what these standards are. You see on the top it says the student will write a final product for an intended audience. That's pretty vague. That's <coughs> one of our current standards, so we know students could write anything. It could be a research paper, it could be a menu, it could really be anything. There's not um, really any structure to it. Under the common core, we can see that with guidance and support from adults, um, using technology, and this is a great example of how technology is incorporated. So they will have to develop keyboarding skills. We know that is something that's vital to today's uh, workforce and community in college. Um, they will have to interact and collaborate with others in writing that product. So it's much, much more rigorous. There are more steps. They know that the skills they're working on are peer collaboration, technology, and uh, review from educators. This is an example of a a third grade writing standard. Um, moving on is a sixth grade mathematics standard. You can see here it talks about um, use and justify the, the rules for adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, um, and finding the absolute value of integers. So we, we talk about absolute value, and I'm not so far removed from education that I shouldn't remember what it is. But when you look at the Common Core, and it, and it gives an example, this is not what the teachers have to teach, this is just an example um, of absolute value. For comparison, recognize that an account balance less than negative 30 represents a debt greater than 30. That is something that makes it relevant. That makes it useful and applicable to real life. We all balance our checkbooks, our checkbooks, so we know that if we see if we have a negative, we have absolute value there because we have a greater a debt greater than um, whatever that number is. So we move to a seventh grade reading standard, and this is a really good example of the um, the how concise these standards are. Uh, the current standard talks about uh, students must learn a variety of comprehension strategies. Under Common Core, it says must trace and evaluate arguments um, and specific claims in a text and provide evidence for that reasoning. And comprehension strategies take many forms. I could be teaching my student how to use a highlighter in reading and, and highlight the portions they think are important to remember. But another teacher in my sixth grade could be teaching cause and effect and how things relate to each other. So our students, even though we both would have met that current standard, will have very different skills when they move on to the next grade. So Common Core focuses on making sure students really have the skills they need to move forward and that the expectation is there that across the grade. And finally, um, 
this is another example of, of how these standards make things relevant to life. This talks about conditional probability under our current standards, um, which determines the probability of independent events. Under Common Core, it's recognized and explained the concept, so you really have to know what conditional probability is to be able to explain it in your work. It's not just here's the answer, don't you know, I might have done some of the work right or not. It's I have to explain what I did and why. And then it provides that relevant example. Um, compare the chance of having lung cancer if you're a smoker with being a smoker if you have lung cancer. That is something that as adults we may um, we may know somebody who never smoked in their life and they have lung cancer. Or you know, as a relevant um, use of conditional probability, so it helps them explain it in, in their life. Um, we look at the implementation timeline in Florida, and when we go back to the State Board of Action in 2010, so it's, it's not new, but um, over the last few years, we've had kind of a strategic implementation timeline in 2011 and 12. Uh, kindergarten classrooms in Florida were implementing the standards in 2012-13, this past school year is K-1. As we head into this coming school year, it's K-1 and 2, will be fully implemented in the standards and then it will be a blended curriculum or blended standard um, model for uh, grades 3 through 12, where they will be learning both next generation Sunshine State and Public Core. And we're doing this because currently we're still assessing with the FCAP. We know we cannot uh, assess students on something they're not taught to. So we're preparing them um, by blending them. We're preparing them for the Common Core and what instruction and assessment will be like um, the next year in 14-15 when it's fully implemented across all grades and we have the aligned assessment. Um, so really quickly about that assessment, mm -hmm. we know there are um, there's a few changes and this chart shows kind of how the changes are occurring. You'll see that um, FCAP reading and writing will be completely replaced with the Common Core Aligned Assessment for grades 3 through 11. And it's a shift because writing is only assessed currently in grades 4, 8, and 10. Yeah. And um, under this Common Core, it will be assessed every year. So it will be reading and writing every year grades 3 through 11. Um, we move to mathematics, and we know um, grades uh, 3 to 8 will shift to a fully common core aligned assessment as well. And then we look at um, our end of course assessment or EOCs as we refer to them. And our Algebra 1 and Geometry EOC that we currently have will change to be aligned to the standard standards. And we will also be creating a new EOC for Algebra 2. FCAT 2.0 science will remain, and so will the U.S. history, civics, and biology uh, in this course assessment. So those will not change. Now the assessment, we look at it, we've talked about these are more rigorous standards. So obviously with more rigorous standards, we have a more rigorous assessment. So we will focus questions away from multiple choice, away from filling in that bubble, and move to really pulling out some explanation. It will be much more written, tax-focused um, questions where they have to pull the evidence out and show in their in their logic and reasoning why they're, they're arguing that this is the important part. Um, and we're, we're going to shift as well to an assessment that is truly more reflective of what our students know because of that that emphasis on explanation. So the, um, the next slide shows a little bit of what a current assessment question looks like. It talks about multiplication of the skill they're focused on. Um, Mr. Avery bought four play kitchens. They were $139 a piece. How much did he spend? 
So you do four times 139, put in your answer, and you're done. The next slide shows what uh, a common core aligned assessment question could look like. Um, right there it says PARC because the board is still committed to PARC. Um, the department will decide uh, before long whether or not we continue with PARC. But um, focusing on this question, it shows that students will have multiple steps in their, in their um, questions. They will have to show an explanation. So we have three classes going on a field trip and a chart to show the attendance. And then we see transportation options. And there are um, uh, there are different amounts of seats available in each. So the students have to really show here, not only do they have to be able to show that they can do multiplication in determining how many people are going on this, uh, but they also have to be able to do different combinations so they can that they answer later once they've done the work and we see that which um, which combination can be used to take everyone on the field trip. So they really have multiple steps to show that they really have understanding. Um, next, most of uh, uh, what I have a few resources up here. We have um, FloridaStandards.org. That is uh, a website that holds all the academic standards for Florida, uh, the Common Core Mapping ELA, as well as Next Generation Sunshine State Standards. Um, CoreStandards.org is a website that the National Governors Association and Council for Chief State School Officers established, and that has resources around the development. <coughs> and then the TeachingChannel.org, which I'm sure um, our educators probably have referenced a time or two or used themselves, but it is a great uh, resource. If you go on and search Common Core, you can pull up videos of what instruction will look like. So as you prepare for the coming school year and you want to know what will the classroom look like um, for my students, you can go on and view some um, uh, instruction there. Uh, we also have a new website coming up from the department in the next month. And um, we're continuing to work with educators on professional development. Uh, that's all for me this time, so I'll turn it over to Jan Spies to talk a little bit about things.
auditors have a right to come in and review not your individual child's records, but are we following legal procedures? Okay, so we're, we're being audited there. And of course, if we are subpoenaed, or your student transfers. If a student transfers to Marion County, we have a right to send the educational records on to Marion County without your written permission. <coughs> to appropriate parties with regards to the health or safety, law enforcement, Patriots Act, something horrendous is happening. We have a right and a duty to let them know that information. Public health has a right to access your child's health records. They have a right to come in with any kind of situation with communicable disease. And they have a right of immediate access to, for public safety. Um, we must share information with regard to a registered sex offender, uh, initiated by the parent of the district, any legal action. We have to help disclose information. And there is something called directory information. And this is the one where um, we, we get into the most questions from the police directory information. Um, directory information is demographic, it's demographic, it's enrollment, it's attendance, it's discipline, health. All these kinds of things are collected on students each and every day. It is not for public knowledge. They can't just come in and access anything on any student at any time. You must have reason and you must have um, a purpose. And that is cleared through our office, okay? So you cannot come in and get information on the child across the street from you. You cannot come in and get information with regards, and no, nor can anyone come in and get information from you. But we do keep all of this information in our system. Student assessment. We do many, as you've heard from the, uh, from the educational, the teaching side of the house. We do many assessments, and those assessments are, of course, maintained. Many of them in the teachers' uh, grade books and their uh, reference books, but we also keep many of those on our electronic system. And again, that information is transmitted because of state laws and federal laws to the state, and the state sometimes sends those information back. But the access of an individual student's record is not available to the public. Okay, information would go up there and back. Cannot access individual student information. Why do we collect this data? And again, as I reference, we are complying with local, state, federal reporting, and to the point where each school has access to their own records based on the principal's discretion. Um, counselors in schools would have access to the entire school's uh, student population there so they can access and work with any student. But they don't have access to the high school's records next to them. So you only have access to the students that you have responsibility for. Other records are denied. And again, there are some district level staff such as myself that would have access to all student records because I'm in charge of those. So the main thing is just for you to walk away with is to know that in this age where we are collecting data and sharing data, your individual student data is very highly protected under federal law, and that information cannot just be given to somebody who comes in and asks for it. Okay, there's a deep process and uh, many, many protections to make sure that that does not happen. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to one of Lake County's outstanding teachers, April on Mackey.
common core. However, as a science teacher, I knew that I covered those standards with the laboratory writing that my students would do in class. Um, in addition to, our district offers support for um, science teachers, actually for all teachers, and I receive support in, to supplement my content. Um, so, as I looked at my standards, I said I've got this covered. Um, as Ms. Stevens mentioned, um, the timeline for implementation going into the 2012-2013 school year, um, I pulled the course description once again, looked at the resources that the district provided to us, and realized I have all these new English language arts or math standards, or what I believe she referred to as the literacy standards for my content area. So I said to myself, uh-oh, um, I'm going to need to do something different because my laboratory report writing is not necessarily going to cover those new standards. So again, back to district support. I had some training, um, used the teaching channel as she mentioned, and learned more about the Common Core because that was the focus now being put in my biology class. So, um, looking at these shifts, this is what was um, laid out for me. Number one was building knowledge through content-rich nonfiction. Um, when I look at that, I think, okay, building knowledge through, through content-rich nonfiction. Can that be my textbook? Because we do use the textbook in the class as a resource. Um, the second shift said reading, writing, and speaking grounded in evidence from the text, both literary and informational. So I knew in my classroom, in the science classroom, I can cover the informational part. Don't do a whole lot of literary, but definitely informational. Um, the third, regular practice with complex text and its use of academic language. So, if I walk you through my lesson or walk you through what I do in my classroom, I thought I was doing okay with these shifts. So I wasn't really, you know, worried about them. Um, if you could move this slide. Um, this is before Common Core. Um, what I would do in my classroom is access students' prior knowledge about whatever topic that we were learning. And um, from there, I would use the textbook as a resource to sort of deepen their knowledge or build new knowledge. Um, from there, we would do a vocabulary activity, pulling out those terms that we need to know. Again, the state of Florida provides a course description, and our district offers blueprints that helps us, you know, these are key terms that we need to know. <coughs> so we do some vocabulary activities. Um, then comes my favorite part, and probably the student's favorite part, in regard to the experimentation process. Um, typically, as I mentioned, we would write laboratory reports uh, or present posters, such as this. Um, this is basically a laboratory report broken up into parts or sections, and um, I know it's a little hard to see, but on the left-hand side, you see the title and the author, then you have the abstract where the students are going to write something about the experiment that they're doing. Um, underneath that will be their results or findings. Um, then in the middle panel, you see the introduction to the experiment. What was the experiment all about? Um, underneath that is the methodology. What methodology, what experimentation process did you use to obtain these results? Then you have a discussion section. Then um, lastly, it's literature cited. So this is before the common core shift. This is what I would do in my classroom with my students. Um, and then they would actually speak to one another about this. And I thought that was pretty good. My students are writing. They're using um, guided practice for this experiment. Um, they're learning vocabulary. Um, but like Mr. Metz mentioned, um, some of this is regurgitation because they've got their textbook there, they've got the guided handout that shows them step by step the cookbook experiment or maybe a little bit of guided practice. 
step by step to guide them through. So then, can you go back to that shift part? The shift slide? Sorry, thank you. Um, so I went back to this and I said, well, am I really understanding what this means? And um, building knowledge through content-rich nonfiction. Okay, how can I increase that knowledge base? Rather than just using the textbook or rather than just me standing up here talking about photosynthesis, what can my kids do to deepen their knowledge and deepen their understanding of that content? Then secondly, reading, writing, and speaking grounded in evidence from the text. Okay, they need to get knowledge from another source besides myself and the textbook. And that third shift supports that. In regular practice with complex text, I need as a teacher to reach out to those English language folks and say, hey, what articles can I use? What is another source that I can use to deepen the knowledge of my students to use complex text other than my textbook and to get them to read and write and speak, showing evidence from those texts, those complex texts. Um, so if you go, this was after common course. So what I did is I said, okay, I can do this. Went back to the same lessons, not actually the same lesson, but used the same strategies and skills. Used um, the whole trifold poster again and, and went one step further and allowed my students to produce a product. And this is the writing component of the product. So again, we access prior knowledge on whatever topic we were learning. Actually, I think it's photosynthesis, um, if I remember right. So access, photo, um, access prior knowledge about photosynthesis. And the benchmark, all the benchmark says is identify the product and the reactants of photosynthesis. Well, you guys know we breathe out CO2, we breathe in oxygen. That's all they needed to know. Um, that's not enough to get us where we need to be. That's not enough to be a scientist in the world we live in today. So instead of identifying products and reactants, we need to go deeper. So that's what we did. Um, so again, access prior knowledge, took vocabulary, learned vocabulary through complex text, we read, we did close reading, and really deepened our understanding. Um, still perform the same experiment that I showed you before on the before picture, although what my students did is took the information that they obtained from one another and their data and incorporated it into a writing piece. Because if you notice, it was reading, writing, and speaking grounded in evidence from the text. I needed to bump up. I needed to have them write some sort of scientific journal so that we could actually then say, hey, would you mind sharing, you know, here's my um, article, here's my journal, would you mind reading it and I'll read yours? So it became um, a collaborative whole classroom group. Um, it was pretty awesome. But I will tell you as a teacher, it, it takes some time to do this and it takes some time to really understand what's being asked in those standards. And we do have support as teachers. We have our district to support us um, and they understand and they're um, working very hard to give us tools to help us. Um, but it takes the teacher understanding what's being asked and reaching out and saying, hey, what does this really mean? What does this actually look like? So now I feel confident moving forward that I can be a 21st century teacher and prepare my students for this world. Um, with that, Kelly Susana. Uh, Good morning. It is so wonderful to see you here this morning. Your support of Lake County Schools means so much to us. My name is Kelly Kuzno. I am a proud teacher at East Ridge Middle School in Claremont. We have always considered it our goal at the middle school level to build upon the solid foundation of the elementary school level as we prepare our students for the rigor of the high school level. level. And with the emergence of the Common Core Standards, I feel better equipped to prepare my students to bridge that gap between elementary school, middle school, and high school. Because what we see with the Common Core Standards is this upward spiral effect. 
Students have to have a strong foundation of literacy um, in one grade before moving up to the next, and Ms. Stevens referenced that this morning. Um, in my role at East Ridge, I teach an elective class that is focused on uh, design to accelerate student learning um, through the use of research-based instruction and effective methods for delivery. And one of the things that we focus on a lot, we focus on three things primarily. Um, that would be higher level questioning, reading comprehension, and writing. Let's focus for just a minute about higher level questioning because as you sit there, you probably have a pretty good understanding that reading comprehension and writing are important as we prepare our students to be college and career ready. But how does having good questioning skills impact our students as they move through the grade level? I'm going to give you an example if you'll, if you'll uh, sort of play along with me. Um, I, I'm going to give you two questions and I want you to consider the two questions. I want you to think specifically about the types of responses that a student or someone that, that you may ask the question might respond to the individual question. Um, the first question number one is what was the start date of the Civil War? And question number two is can you analyze the causes of the Civil War? Those questions um, obviously deal with the same topic, but as you consider the responses that you would receive from, different, from each question um, are vastly different. Let's look at the first one. The first question was, what was the start date of the Civil War? Um, again, we, we've heard this simple memorization is not where we want to go, and I think a lot of us could agree that simple memorization would be the way to answer that first question. And I would suggest to you that just because a student can tell me the start date of the Civil War, it does not indicate that there is any mastery of the concept, uh, concept besides, besides that one key point. Now, the second question requires a more in-depth analysis of the war itself to answer. So if a student can cite for us um, the, the, and, and analyze the causes of the Civil War, we're seeing a real application come into play if they can thoroughly answer that. And why do we want our students to have good questioning skills? Well, we want our students to be able to process information at a higher level. So if they're able to ask these questions in class, or if they're able to answer those questions from another peer, I can guarantee that the dialogue that follows will be a lot more cognitively <coughs> complex. When students can ask those higher level questions of their teachers, of their peers, where they're engaging in a very uh, good dialogue that's going to build on those critical thinking skills. We've heard that term, building critical thinking skills. That is an important key piece and being able to apply knowledge to the real world, being able to take it out there and, and build out those concepts is certainly an important skill as well. Um, a strategy that I use in my class specifically that is very common for aligned is something referred to as Socratic Seminar. And Socratic Seminar engages students in <coughs> constructive and thoughtful dialogue involving a text. Um, so I, I, I'm working with 12 and 13 year old children, so I generally find an article or something that is of interest to them. Uh, to give you some examples, this last year we did a Socratic seminar on texting and driving, um, bullying in our schools. These are generally things that, that the students are interested in. Um, I, we pass out the article, we read it, we, we do a little bit of dissection of it, and then we literally sit in a circle and have a discussion about the article itself. Um, our students learn through peer dialogue and questioning. They go a little more in depth into the nature of the article. It hits on some of the common core standards of being able to find thorough and strong textual evidence as well as speaking and listening skills because those are traits that are embedded in common core assessments that we also want our students to be able to master. Um, I was fortunate enough in February to attend a national elevating and celebrating teachers and teaching convening. Um, I am still excited about that conference and a lot of what excited me was we had very great conversations with other educators around the country about Common Core. And the more opportunities I have to speak with other educators about it, the more I am convinced 
that what we are doing in Lake County is very remarkable work. I am a teacher, I am a parent, I have ch three children in three different schools in Lake County. I feel that Common Core is going to impact their education greatly. As a teacher, I feel that this coming together of the Common Core connects all of us. And when we put our collective brilliance and creativity and student empowerment together, I feel that we're just going to build a stronger education system. Am I excited about the Common Core? Absolutely, there is no doubt. Um, as a teacher leader, I strive to um, always be trying to grow, trying to improve my practice. Um, I want to be as effective as I can in the classroom with your children. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, April Von Good morning. She is such a touch. Ever got to hear about her? I just always amazed when Kelly said this. Thank you, Kelly, for that. A little bit taller. So, good morning. Thank you very much for being here. I'm April Von Maxey. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Tiberi Elementary School. And I'm a very proud Lake, uh, Lake County graduate. I am a very K-12 student, so this is Lake County at work here. So I'm very proud to be part of our district in the teaching aspect as well as a student. Um, part of the elementary that I will be representing today is from both sides. I'm fourth grade, so I am a blending here. I'll be speaking from the kindergarten and first and second grade perspective, as well as what we are going to be in the upper grades as women's team as well. I have those two perspectives for you. So to begin with, just like we mentioned earlier, teachers will be um, using the basal text, which is the classroom textbook, as a resource. The textbook no longer going to be the driving force for curriculum. It's going to be the standard and the classroom and the needs of the students as well. One of the beautiful things about Common Core, writing more curriculum, pulling in what interests the students, just like the articles do, putting what's on the minds of the students and on the needs. Um, it also is going to require teacher collaboration. Common um, Core could be a lot for one teacher to handle, but we're not one teacher. We are collective and we can depend on each other to help each other out, to reach out, to be a, a force for somebody else who needs help, to work together. And we can do that through professional learning communities at our schools and lesson studies to help us look at effective teaching practices. All right, there's also some increased accountability in writing, just like Andrea mentioned, how there's going to be increased writing in all subjects. Social studies, science, math. Kids are writing in math, and it's actually really, really good stuff. Um, there's also interdisciplinary learning with the maths unit. This is something that Lake County is really supporting our teachers with, especially with the STEM program. And STEM is the science, technology, engineering, and math push. You might have heard that as kind of a buzzword right now. But our county has something for the third, fourth, and fifth grade students where they um, set up a coach at each school for each grade level, and those, those coaches choose students based on interest and based on ability or based on desire to come out of school and practice competition skills or practice strategies or work on building concepts that help them to work towards a more blended math and science concept. And then they go into a competition in February where we can compete against each school. And I believe this year we have, I know in fourth grade we have 100% participation from all elementary schools. And it's really cool to see the kids work together. Kids who you probably would never have thought would work together click and they are able to work through difficulty and able to work through success. And there's also the LDC program, which is what Andrew was mentioning. And you can be two parties, social studies and reading blend. Where you take a topic, say, the fourth grade, what was Harriet Tubman's greatest achievement? Well, she's mainly known for three fantastic things students read charts, articles, personal letters, to find opinions of their own in these articles, and then they produce the writing for it on their opinions based on the articles that they have read. Then there's also the push for social development. Common Core is really great about that. Getting kids to come out of their shelves to work together, to think about what can I do to work better with this person? Because as we know, we have to work with people that we do get along with and sometimes that are more of a challenge. And we have to work through that. We are teaching that to our students and they are discovering what works best for them. And then there's also the 
not forgetting the that they have to have their personal practice time. There is need for individual practice, that perseverance, working through the difficult times. How can I find the answer on my own instead of waiting there for something? So we no, let's see, how are you going to find it on your own? How are you going to own your own learning? And then my favorite part, the, the inquiry-based learning part, that is the part that I love the most, is, is the inquiry-based learning is the product-based learning. A teacher not just having a test on the Friday, but instead, what we learned this week, or what we learned through this unit, we're going to put in a project. How is this really tied to the real world? Um, it's going to inspire teachers to seek the real world application for me in science, but um, such as is wind energy a form of energy sustainable in Florida? Or would we be better for fossil fuels? Or solar energy? When I, I use that when I teach about resources and alternative energy. Or um, can a marble loop the loop in a roller coaster? Use that when I teach about motion energy. How is that sustainable? How is that important? Because it teaches to students to see about the motion, how motion is connected to our real world. Or, one of my favorites, how does the size of PVC tubes affect the pitch of a blue neighbor instrument when we discover sound? Because they need to understand that it's the length of the tube, not the width of the tube, how sound travels and how sound echoes in a bigger room, in a smaller room. Um, it, it's also inspired a co uh, collaborative activity with my math teacher, Stephanie Muller. And we brought our two classes together mixed them all up so they could be with their peers, and we gave them the task for the von Moeller Architects Group to design a barn with two, two sticks and marshmallows that could accommodate Farmer Brown's needs and budget. They worked together to use perimeter, area, volume, multiplication skill, addition, subtraction, and the debating skill if they had to discuss their ideas, all of which made this project incredibly meaningful to show students how science and math and collaboration and communication skills really have a place in our everyday lives. It was a huge hit, and we got to see some really, really great marshmallow stick farm. So the kids really understood volume, which I was teaching in science, perimeter and area, that Mrs. Muller was teaching in math, and math addition and subtraction, which was in everyday life. They were able to see that's how that really fits. And this is how we'd be able to pay us to fit in this building, but still come $50,000 in the budget. They were really, they were really impressive things. That's really fun. So Andrea, Kelly, and I hope that we have given you a thorough understanding of the common core from a teacher's perspective and how we are as a collaborative moving forward with this shift with the support of our district as well. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Hadwell, our curriculum uh, officer, to open the floor for questions. Thank you. teacher used uh, in language and so forth, I think you just saw three of uh, our very effective teachers in Lake County were very fortunate to have them in the classroom. Uh, at this time, <laughs> individuals such as themselves, practitioners in the classroom, will be the ones that really make the common core uh, standards come to life in the classroom and do what's best for children. So again, thank you ladies for a wonderful job. At this time, we want to uh, entertain questions. Uh, this time, in this venue, we have a mic set up, and I believe Mr. Patton is uh, ready. And so if you have a question, please come up and you can state your name and your question. We have staff members, we have principals here uh, that will be more than happy to uh, answer questions that you might have. So the floor is yours at this time.
very much for that question. It's hard. It's, it's really 
really hard. It's not one of those one thing going to have the magic pill to secure it all. It's going to be us all having to really work together and be positive okay. with each other. One last thing yeah, I have to question is this. With Common Core, <coughs> what the new system is put into play, is there going to be more information out there? Because I did the research on FCAT 2.0 or whatever. You go out to the website and they barely had like this <laughs> to look at when you first went out there. So we just, I, as a parent, I, I can do my best in researching it if it's there. So, and I completely understand the 2.0. Frustration. We felt that as teachers, but we were like, we need more support on 2.0. We ran into that wall as well. Um, for Common Core, I think I'll let my kids back up. Um, but Common Core is, because it's been going on for so much longer and it's been in more states, we as teachers have been able to find lots of resources and information about alternative resources. Um, as far as um, Florida's assessment and the um, park, which is the state of park, their website has information now, and they've made a lot of movement in terms of readiness and resources um, to help give more information to parents and educators. So you could go onto their, their website. If it's plan B, whatever that may look like, the department's committed to making sure we have the resources out there for you to know what to expect, where to go, and all of that. And um, we'll make sure that that's out there any way we can to help. And we will also have information on that new website I mentioned earlier around the assessments and, and those resources. So we're committed to making sure that we're ready in all aspects. And, and um, in terms of the assessment as well, um, and especially with children and that whole shift, and you mentioned the shift in rigor and standards. And so the rigor the assessment is going to be different. Any time we have a standard change and we have that aligned assessment change and there's an increase in rigor, we see for kind of change for the first couple of years. And oftentimes people refer to it as a dip because it looks like they go down. But I always say it's a reset button because it's a different test with different expectations. And so we can't really compare it apples to apples, it's apples to oranges. And so and when we make that shift in 14-15 and a few years following, look to that first third grade, that first third grade um, cohort that's taking the assessment because they will have had, going back to that strategic implementation timeline, only common core line <coughs> standard implementation and they'll be more prepared whereas the rest of our students will, over the first few years, have a shift in learning and they will have to change and, and, and they're going to have a little bit of a struggle. doesn't mean they're not capable. They're not, it doesn't mean they became less intelligent overnight. It means they're becoming more challenged and they're becoming better prepared and they're going to get there. So we're, we're all going to need to be um, a community and come together and, and be around that and work the department committed to making sure parents and educators and everyone else are prepared and have the resources they need. We'll get there, and then it'll, it'll be there. Promise. I just want to speak a little bit about um, the question that Mrs. Wellen's question regarding um, how will Common Core help lessen the anxiety of students? Being a parent of a third grade student now going on to fourth grade and being an administrator in Lane County, I understand exactly where you're coming from. And the way I feel Common Core will help um, with the anxiety of students because Common Core ties in a lot of collaboration and critical thinking within the classroom. And what I have seen on my campus as well as with my daughter and her teacher at her school is that when they're working in groups, collaborative groups, and they're not under, a particular student's not understanding something specifically, if they're working in a group, that peer interaction will help them learn because they get more information from their peers. As a parent, I saw my daughter's anxiety lesson about what was approaching her with the FCAT um, for third grade and whether she would be retained or going to fourth grade because she was able to work in her group. And that was a very key part to her. And from beginning third grade to the middle to the end, I saw a great progression to the point that I had saved a lot of her papers to share with my teachers about these are things that are happening and that collaboration had that big piece to do with her lesson anxiety. So, um, as well, and I hope that gave a little bit of insight as far as how Common Core is different than FCAT 2.0 and that testing uh, format 
and it allows for more collaboration and students to work together more, and that will help lessen their anxiety. Uh, yeah, first of all, my uh, congratulations to the school district for surviving all these constant changes. Because, you know, I've been going to the board meeting for five or six years, and I've never seen so many changes so that the corporations couldn't keep up with the constant rule changes that you have to cope with. Uh, I've become kind of a, a, a heavy uh, researcher on Common Core, and there are a lot of parties across the country that are opposing it. Um, and I've written a fact sheet on that. Uh, the issue is, just a couple of them, is that one, the park standards, which now the state is looking at getting out of, are developed by two very verifiable liberal groups that are tied to people that maybe a lot of conservatives don't have a lot of respect for. And I know that the school districts have to implement what the state says, so I'm not asking you. I mean, again, my sympathy is because you have to adopt what the state tells you to. Um, but if they are able to get out of the park and develop a state level testing system, that will remove maybe part of a lot of concern about Common Core. Uh, the other thing is that there's a lot of people concerned that there's a lot of information woven into the standards, into the curriculums that are being sold and marketed to the schools, and also being woven into the park testing assessments that reflect a liberal way of thinking. And I think that uh, the school districts across the state and across the country, a lot of them aren't following that and don't realize that. And I would ask that maybe you talk a little bit, because you know this is a conservative county. There are a lot of people concerned about whether their kids are being taught uh, what the Constitution says versus you know, supporting big government and the collective type of thinking. And uh, how are you responding to that, or how are you monitoring those concerns to know that your teachers are aware of that when they come up with different ways of teaching the kids? Because uh, I can remember the movie Lord of Flies, and that was pure. You know, those kids became a peer group to talk, teach each other and basically started killing each other when kids are left by their own and adult supervision. So uh, I would maybe like to hear you know, an explanation of how you're going to ensure that uh, Christian values and the individual, the, the, the rights of the individual, are still being taught as opposed to what we call the socialist type of group, uh, socialist programs. Thank you. I think in response to that concern, I think the processes that uh, the state of Florida has in place, as well as our Board of Education here, we have both, uh, a process to vet any type of textbooks, any materials that have come forward that our state adopted. So we have a vetting process at the state level. Then it comes to the schoolhouse, and we have teachers from all schools. A good example was we adopted the a reading program this year, K-5 with McGraw-Hill. They go through the process of vetting that, and then it comes to the curriculum committee. And finally, it comes to our Board of Education to vote on it after it's going through that process. Uh, whether we're adopting Common Core State Standards or any other standard, every teacher has to be uh, professional in how they portray facts. Uh, we cannot promote, nor can we inhibit religious convictions. That's why many people came to this country was freedom to practice religion and what they believe. I have my beliefs. Many of you have your beliefs. I know when the Bible fell uh, and so forth. But uh, we will stand to uphold the Constitution. Uh, again, I think we just have to understand uh, that there are, are people over a period of time that may try to look at uh, indoctrinating students with materials that aren't appropriate. But I think we have in place a good practicing principal leadership in our district and understand where they're at, where they live. Have you ever many of our teachers grew up here at Lake County? So when you have practitioners in the classroom who grew up and understand the roots and so forth, and I think what Lake County is very fortunate to have that. We don't have quite the cosmopolitan uh, group and so forth. And, uh, so therefore, I think we have in place many uh, 
areas to uh, students uh, and so forth with board policy, state statute, and a vetting process. And if there's any materials ever that come to concern, we establish committees following board policy at the schoolhouse. They review it, determine if it's an appropriate or appropriate line, uh, what the, the particular standard is, and what the students is. So uh, that would be my comment to that. And I know, again, that comes back to what Representative Metz spoke of. Uh, there's things being taken out of context and so forth. And so, uh, again, I know if you read materials, what's happening in other districts and so forth, that uh, people are trying to intertwine different political platforms into standards. And our teachers still have the freedom uh, to uh, provide the, the uh, creativity and the instructional methodology to get the common core uh, standards across the districts. So hopefully I answered that. Any other comments you want to make, Dr. Monson? Feel free. We have a, a very
I don't have concerns about that in Lake County. Now, if somebody does make a, an error in judgment, we would be addressing it as well as our principals would be addressing it. Uh, and that's where you go to first is to the school principal, who's the CEO of the school, and then uh, it will come up from there if it's not resolved properly. And I'll let Dr. Moxley address this as well. Look at the Common Core standards, and if you go to Lake County's curriculum, we actually have um, several documents that are used. We have uh, curriculum maps, we have uh, um, uh, task cards that are used by our teachers to help map and unpack the standards. And what I mean by that is to break them down into very manageable, teachable types of units that, that the teachers can use in the classroom. We are not prescriptive that says on day. One, every teacher in Lake County that is a third grade teacher will say and do exactly the same script. We don't have scripts like that. We have the standards, we have them broken down, and we have a map that outlines where you need to be at approximately certain points of the year because we want to make sure that you're pacing your instruction so that at the end of the year when students do take the test and have to demonstrate mastery, that they've had the ample time to uh, learn it and apply their skills and develop that mastery of which they have to produce. Nowhere in the Common Core standards that I have read, nowhere in our curriculum maps, nowhere in our benchmark assessments, nowhere in our task cards do you see any of those items that Ms. Rasko outlined. Palm rated, all those other things that she was talking about. Nowhere do those types of activities are those required or supported in our curriculum. We break it down in very fast pace. Dr. Tom. I think our question referred to identifying students by scanning their eyes and the palm. Absolutely, and the other, that is the second part of my thing, so thank you for uh, making sure that we cover that. Nowhere in our district do we have students come up and we scan their iris or take their fingerprints or, or any of that information. We do not collect that type of information. The medical information that we collect is what Jan Tobias highlighted earlier in the presentation, and that is for their educational services that their IEP or their medical health plans require for them to academically perform in our school setting. So again, I want you to make sure that nowhere do we have activities as part of learning activities, and nowhere do we collect data that is that intrusive in the educational program. Um, and I know we've heard that out there. We have a, and I'm going to go a little further in explanation that wasn't for the question, but it did come up in some news media with some districts in, in the nation where they were allowing studies to be conducted in their classrooms with students. We do have research that goes on in our district that um, that is all vetted through Dr. Thomas's office. And we have a very prescriptive, comprehensive process to apply and give permission to conduct research. And it is usually in the, the, the format of uh, analyzing um, uh, practices. You know, what are the best practices to uh, uh, achieve this type of uh, learning gain? What are our public record test scores as a district saying? And that's all public record. So it's all public record information and it's uh, demographic information that is group data. We do not ever give student, individual student uh, record information that would devolve or violate FERPA in any shape or form. So research is usually approved in that manner. We do not do any of that research that requires the virus scanning, fingerprinting, um, printing, etc. And if I could just elaborate on that, any time students are used in research of any kind, we always require the researcher to obtain parent permission for students to be involved in that research. We are very, uh, we take that very seriously. There are protocols that if it's done by a university that the university has to follow that involve parent notification and permission. And we also put our own layer on that as well. So um, I, I, hopefully that expanded enough to answer that question. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for clarifying. Yes, sir. I've been out of the educational loop for 50 plus years. 
So, but I uh, am observing my daughter and grandkids going through school. I was wondering what effect, if any, would this Common Core standards have on the opportunity for exceptional students to participate in advanced placement, honors programs, etc. I think more importantly, it will prepare students for advanced placement courses that are under the auspices of the College Board, and Lake County is pushing very hard, uh, and if anything, it will prepare students to be more successful because you're going to be dealing with higher application skills, critical thinking that we spoke of earlier, that lends itself to advanced placement courses for college credit. Okay. So it will really expand that, I feel, and will benefit us tremendously.
And um, one of the benefits we have heard through professional um, collaboration and PLCs, um, I noticed that at, personally at my own campus, my principal is very open to um, teachers coming up with the ideas, what is it that the teachers need for professional learning. So as we meet every Wednesday morning an hour before school for that professional development, it is, aside from the faculty meeting that is once a month, it is teacher-driven. It is what teachers have asked for, it is what teachers want, it is what I want. When I'm going in an hour early in the morning, I want to be able to, to get the skills and things that I need. So I don't, I, I think we kind of, you know, it, it, the, the shift is different and the, the motivation is just very different. We just really want to do the absolute best by our children, as the three of us can say, we're parents as well, the children that are in Lincoln County Schools, and, and we want them to have the absolute best, we want to give the absolute best. Okay, we want to take a couple more questions before and then I'll have Dr. Moxley. I'd, uh, I'd just like to make a comment because uh, I recall when, they, when I first started reading the paper about Common Core and we heard all the concerns that the big bad socialist government was coming in to take over. I remember that Bill, uh, Bill on the school board, Matthias, Bill Matthias on the school board, who I don't think is known as a real uh, liberal thinker, uh, cautioned us against worrying about the big bad government going to take us over, but this was a good program <coughs> that we should be trying to do the right thing. Quickly, I'm here at uh, Aunt Barbara to uh, Luke and Noah, and, but I am a retired educator. Uh, my concern is as I listen to these teachers talk, there's a funding issue here. Hopefully that the state will provide more funds for these classroom teachers because of the materials you need to implement project-based learning. And you don't get that deeper level without the project-based learning. So hopefully there's some funding coming for those classroom materials that you're going to need. Secondly, I'm also happy that Luke and Noah, when they take the PARC test, hopefully, that they will be compared to the uh, children in Georgia, South Carolina, Illinois, New York, California. They will all be compared apples to apples. I worked for a national publishing company and I was responsible for doing correlations for all of those states to make sure that we were covering all of their standards and objectives in one reading period, which was not also impossible. But as long as we looked at the state of Texas, those textbooks were written for the state of Texas because they had more rigorous standards at that time. And we're talking about mid to late 80s. So I'm glad that when Luke and Noah apply to college, and they're competing against kids who come from other states, that they're all on the same playing field. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I come from a Montessori background. As far as my daughter's education, she was in the Montessori AMI um, school for nine to nine and a half years before she went to a public um, uh, charter school at Round Lake. And throughout those years, everything is very hands-on very physical, even from early on in preschool, they, you know, they, they touch the beads and count them individually and turn them in, physically turn them in, 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 in for strings of ten, when they have you know, enough a hundred of them, they turn them in for a square of a hundred and they can see ten times ten equals a hundred and it's a square. It's, a, it's not just that they see it, they physically touch it. And that's, you know, really, it, it involves, you know, that kind of incorporates the whole, that, that's a project based learning she was talking about. And, you know, and a lot of the Montessori material is very hands-on and physical. And um, the, some of the concerns I've heard was that it's, there's so much focus on testing. Where in Montessori that I've seen, there was very little testing. It's just testing was based on the level of work that each kid would do. And once she got into Round Lake, her first year uh, at Round Lake, she made straight A's the whole school year long. She'd never done grades before. She never had homework before. But it was, she knew the work. She knew how to get the, the work done. And the assessment was based on the level of work that they were doing before. So it was, it was a, it fostered a, a pride in the work itself, not in the grades. And on, on the last Common Core meeting I attended, it was um, uh, a website recommended teachingchannels.org. And I looked at that and I was very encouraged with some of the lesson examples. Like for example, when these with an eighth grade edible car, um, competition where the kids actually work hands-on and, and, and exercise 
some engineering you know, skills. And, and there was the, the process of, of trial and error and, and, and learning in that hands-on kind of way. Uh, there was an 11th grade uh, lesson of um, teaching trig trigonometry by actually demonstrating the propeller and how it, it would affect the you know, different, um, whether the speed and the yaw and, and all of those things, but, but they could actually see how the math affected it. And I was wondering how much of that channel, just like the teaching channel at work, those kind of lessons, will, will those hands-on kinds of lessons be involved in this, rather than just writing them? Testing. I think what you've uh, stated is Montessori as an example. We work very hard to differentiate instruction because we know kids learn different ways. Some can sit and take it all in and have a clear understanding. Others need hands-on activities. I think you heard some of our uh, like science, biology, that's hands-on uh, lab type uh, orientation. But many of our elementary classrooms you go in, they have learning stations set up the students move from one station to another. So they have computer time and they have their group time and, and their share time. So they're setting it up so it's a collaborative atmosphere where students can use their skill set and share their strengths. And so I would say we work hard, especially in our elementary, elementary classrooms, to have students hold with the strengths, manage their weaknesses, and what we've heard, your students went right into a traditional school and it's done extremely well because they've got those skill sets uh, that they developed in that type of uh, setting. But uh, teachers do work hard to differentiate to see what students' needs are. Uh, so that goes on on a daily basis. So we are moving. The Common Core is driving us to move from the old methodology where everybody's studying in line like we are right now. And the teacher does talking and lecturing. And you're taking notes. And then, as we stated earlier, people get up and take a, a multiple choice test. What we hope is as the uh, item bank is developed, there will be high application because of some of the examples you saw, where students have to think more critically to apply their knowledge at a higher level. And that's where you have to have hands on activities to do so. So thank you for those comments. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ray Brooks. I'm a big county tech here, uh, raised four children myself. I personally have been subjected to 23 years of education. Okay, so I'm not, not an education expert, but I've been studying this quite a bit uh, last month. I haven't caught up to the end, but uh, I'm trying to get there. And uh, I wanted to share a few things, and I'll be as quick as I can. They're in the context of the questions. But the first of all is I do have a great concern about this. I have to open up to the big stop. Uh, the fundamental transformation going on in our country right now. And uh, let me address this other first question here. It can be rhetorical, it can be answered by Dan. Dan uh, by the way, excellent. I think I said thank you for this. This is really good. You're doing a good job getting the information out there. And, uh, you indicated with regards to the student data, which is where I have a great concern, and a lot of other people do too right now. You mentioned it's highly protected under federal law, deep processes and many protections, which I don't disagree right now. My paradigm is you're doing a great job here, but it's like the city of Detroit and you have a Trojan horse sitting outside your gate, masquerading, okay, as well-intentioned and good, some good standards here, good educational process improvements, but we're in a fundamentally transformed America right now. Can you guarantee, okay, that your student data, our student data, will not be at request given to the IRS, the EPA, the National Security Administration, as well as the Homeland Security Office, any federal agency that wants this information for whatever purposes. Okay? The NSA is building right now a large thumb drive from Utah, you know, and they have objectives for this. Right. Currently, under FERPA, the Federal Education Rights <coughs> Agency, information, first of all, we do not have IRS information on students. Remember, we are students data. So we do not have family data on IRS and those types of things. So with regards to one part of your question, I mean, the data isn't there to give somebody. Um, the only time I can think of would be under an individual situation with a Patriot Act. Uh, since uh, 
September 11th. I mean, there were some changes there, but that information is not not gathered and not shared, and it's not requested. With this kind of exception, we have families that qualify for free and reduced lunch. They must provide some information to us in order for our uh, uh, food department to be able to classify that child as eligible for free and reduced lunch. Okay, and that is a federally protected and federally funded program and provides many, many children in our district free breakfast and or free and reduced lunch. So there are times when some information are shared back and forth, but those are things that have been there for many, many years. Free and reduced lunch has been something that it's always been around. I don't know when it was enacted, but uh, 65, there, the lady in the audience knows. So uh, uh, before, before I was in public education as an educator and not as a student, uh, it has been there. So I cannot tell you that certain things are not shared in order for a student to get benefit as in a free and reduced lunch. But there, there is nothing in FERPA that permits someone to come in and individually ask for information on a student unless it's one of those exceptions, like I said, the Patriot Act or communicable disease, something that has uh, necessary for the public health department to get involved. Thank you. Uh, my concern, of course, is that those types of rules are being violated. You know that right now from what's happening out there. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of information gathered from students. And that is just one major concern. With it. Thank you. I realize what right. you say if we were operating in a law abiding situation, right. it would be correct. Right. And, and I think it's important to know that, that we have instilled many, many safeguards. And our attorneys who I consult with, if I get a situation that is a little unusual, <coughs> are very conservative in their interpretation of the law and, and in terms of what we can release. And in fact, generally what I get is pushback from the community that they think they ought to be able to get information they can't get. But, there was a comment, uh, uh, Kelly, please know, and I've heard this before, and I'm sure you may not have it this way, you talk about uh, in-depth learning, uh, not just memorization, okay? I've been in a lot of meetings <laughs> in uh, aerospace over the years, and the people that do well in those meetings are the ones that have the information on their head. I'm going to do a quick, a very quick demonstration. How many in here, if you know the date, you know, the date and month of Hitler's birthday, raise your right hand. <laughs> How many in here know the, keep your hand, your hand raised. How many in here know the day and month of Lenin's birthday? How many care? <laughs> <laughs> my birthday. My birthday is right between Hitler's and Lenin's. Okay? So this is a trite example of memorization. Memorization has a place that I want to stand. And, and just, we ought to just be careful. Put it in its place, but don't, don't bother to it. Okay. Uh, final, final answer. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, in regards to the standardized uh, standardization, they don't tell us how. In my research, I've recently come across uh, SLC. Maybe you're familiar with SLC. It's uh, one of the uh, CCSO uh, groups. It's the Shared Learning Collaborative. Okay? They are working on curriculum. That's the word, curriculum and other processes. So I, I hear two things. You know, like, is Larry still here? Larry, did he have to leave? Okay. I, I really appreciate your uh, comments. Trying to get to the truth and fact. I'm going to do a real quick demo here. I think I made that one. Oh, my God. This is the, one of our children had this. This is a duplo toy. Okay? And in this duplo toy, you've got red and blue on the balls. Okay? Red and blue on the balls. But what's what happens when you put spin on it? What color was it? Don't just take this information without backing it up. Country is a fundamental transformation. We want to take the advantages of what all this work is preventing as a great opportunity. Now it's got to please work, okay? Don't go forward with it. And I think, uh, <coughs> I think that's all I have. Destroy the horse, okay? 
in my opinion, like I said, that may not have concluded it. It's masquerading as just standardization, just education improvement. But I believe, and I've been to Russia, I spent a summer there in 1970. I have seen communism. I believe that inside the delivery system, they have a sustainable cure. But just one of many other pieces that are out there. That's why I'm taking the time to be here. I'm not getting paid for this like, you know, it's your job and the advocators, but I'm concerned we need to find out what's behind it, change it, don't let us be steamrolled, take the time to do what we have to do. And thank you again for having Thank you for your comments. And we have one more. Hi, <coughs> I, I understand that the, the CCS is a federal uh, program that um, is, is developed and it's, they want the states to adopt it and they're getting an incentive to have the states adopt it, which is not new. But um, what is, uh, from what I understand is new is that uh, there's a copyright on the standards so that anybody, I mean, anyone can use the, use the standards, but if they, can, they won't be infringing on the copyright if they, conform to all of the standards. In other words, they can't pick and choose which ones they want to conform to. They have to conform to all of it. Otherwise, there'll be violation of the copyright infringement on them. And so my understanding is that, well, my question is that um, obviously the reason the state of Florida is adopting this is because they want to receive the benefit, financial benefit from the federal government because that's more money coming into the education, and I, I get that. But I wonder, what will disqualify the state from receiving those uh, that funding because it's an incentive program and if you don't conform to the state standards then you don't get the incentive, you don't get the money. So what would Lake County, what would constitute not qualifying, um, you know, not conforming, which would call, you know, cause them to lose the incentive? And is it the state that's determining this or is it the county, you know, what, what, what would you do that would disqualify you? I think it's our state and so government. The, so the state is basically... Uh, we're working with other states. This was uh, not mandated that they had to they join on their own fruition. Right, I get that. Okay. But obviously they're doing it because they're getting the incentives of the federal well, government. The federal government, yes. Department of Education, is funding two major groups to develop the assessments. Yes. Uh, which is the park group, which we belong to, and then there's a smarter balance, which is another group of states belong to as they develop the assessments. The federal government now is paying for those. I think much of the angst comes in is when you go in and any time you do assessments in any state, you have to pay a testing provider, which we use Pearson over the years in the state of Florida. This just didn't happen. It's been going on since FCAT evolved. Right. right. So we have, legislators have to fund that. Process, and so I think that's the issues that many of the states are grappling with is the testing part of the assessment piece, having technology in place that will accommodate the type of testing. But I don't think anybody, from my viewpoint, being uh, held hostage for money because we're going to get our Title One dollars from the federal government, we're going to get our Title Two dollars, Title One for our students in poverty. Title so II for professional so Are you saying then that if the county doesn't conform, they'll still get the funding? Yes, we would, as long as we comply with Title I, Title II requirements, Title III for our English language learners. Uh, I would not see us being at risk from that standpoint. But we still have to follow state statute. And if our legislature puts in that we will be uh, using common core state standards, we're part of it, and we have to follow and comply with state statute. So it would be up to your legislature if they decide we're not going to, that would be where uh, things would change dramatically. So we're still under the guise of state government here. But this is it's state statute. Then? I mean, you'll get funding regardless if you conform to this at all? She's not against, I guess that's what you mean. I think maybe what um, Michael was saying Recipient, Race to the Top Fund. Common Core State 
standard, then we go back to they were developed, and we were involved in that in 2006, and right to the top didn't even come about until 2009 under the current administration. And these were being developed by governors and school chiefs with the prior White House administration. And so in terms of how are these directly connected to federal funds, the standards are not. Um, under Race to the Top, it was, a, it was a grant to help states get their educational system um, moving forward in several ways. There were, I think, about 5,000 points throughout that um, grant application that could be awarded. Um, adopting college and career ready standards, which the Common Core State Standards are considered one of the options for. Um, where they raised about 40 points out of that massive 5,000. Um, so it's very minimal. We were awarded points because at that, that point, we were focused on adoption of college and career ready standards. Mind you, we already had really strong standards that were focused partially on college and career readiness, or mostly, I should say. And so, in terms of federal dollars, we have received money from that grant. Most of that grant, it was split into, so 350 and 350 million, we received 700 million as a state. 350 was divided amongst the district for their use, and 350 was the state department. A part of that, uh, the largest chunk has been on professional development that the State Department is providing to our educators. We just completed last week, or the week before actually, um, summer institutes where over 15,000 Florida teachers were um, trained by peer facilities. Other teachers came together to work together on Common Core and other collaborations. And part of it is set um, toward um, developing what we refer to as an item bank which is the resources that they can use. Um, part of it is towards programs that will help um, develop administrative programs for principal superintendents. Part of it is for highly effective teachers. And there's other, other many other programs. Where, where can I find all that information? Um, you should be able to find much of it on the State Department's website under Race to the Top. Um, we have records for Lake County Park of the money we receive for Race to the Top. And if you go to our website, you will see a button called Race to the Top. And, we'll and that's our local. Uh, just like Ms. Stevens said, there was $350 million that went to the district. Well, we got our portion of that. And we have a very specific plan of rollout in Lake County. So that's on our website. The state part of it, the other 350 million that Ms. Stevens was talking about, what they did as a state, that is on the FLBOE website. So if you go to the uh, FLBOE.org website, you will be able to see um, on that a, a race to the top button as well, and you can go to all the state data. And is there any record, physical records at the uh, County School Board offices? On Lake County's plan. Yes, we have a document for Lake County plan, and in Lake County, we did uh, a, a we have a whole plan on how we used our race to the top dollars, and it was in technology infrastructure. A big portion of our dollar uh, allotment was on infrastructure in the area of technology, building bandwidth, mm -hmm. uh, building uh, the technological. Well, one of the uh, issues I've had is I've gone to the race to the top site in the ASL. They, um, they do the information, but there's a lot of the uh, that I can't find, which is the specific uh, qualifications, and that's what I'm asking about. Oh, because sure. it does specify that you do have to meet certain standards in order to be eligible for the money, but it doesn't, doesn't you know, it's a generalization, so I'm wondering if there's another location I could go to to find the very specific uh, you know, requirements. And your specific question of the criteria for eligibility, eligibility for that the probably is in the application. That the state did? Is that the public records then? That should be. It should be and it's likely online. It's not in the public and they can give you a copy. It will be massive. Right. Um, but um, that grant is, um, it, it will come to fruition by so in July next year, oh. in 14. And so all of the district funds and state funds will have been spent. Less 
question, I'll let you go. Um, how much has the county received in that, of that 350 million? Okay, I'm now thinking off the top of my head. Um, how does it compare with the other uh, counties? It's a little under five million dollars. That may come. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they are four million something, something. But I can get all that information for you, and I'd like to be able to assist with your questions. If you would uh, see Mr. Patton, and right after this, we'll get uh, some more information from you. So how to contact you, so if we can come across some of that additional information, okay, we'll we'll you pass that your way. Uh, we know time is of the essence here, and you have stayed way over our allotment. If you have additional questions, we're here. We'll be happy to. Mr. Riker, if you have one last question, but I know we've, we've kept everybody way longer than our time. First of all, my name is Richard Riker from North York. Uh, I'd like to say something about Berber. According to Diana Ravitch, if you know who Diana Ravitch is, she was an assistant secretary of education under Clinton and Bush. According to her, uh, the present administration has taken the teeth out of DERPA by eliminating the part of where uh, parents or students have to get their permission for the records to be accessed. And this gives outside vendors much more uh, opportunity to access those, uh, those records. Now my question is, um, how can you reconcile the fact that uh, the only uh, literacy expert on the uh, Common Core Validation Committee, uh, oh, Sander Stosky, uh, refused to sign off on it, saying that the uh, reading material was far below the grade level that it was used in. And the only mathematician refused to sign because he said that the type of math that was taught would only get students into a two year college, not a four year. For university. Uh, the first part being um, that neither Dr. Stotsky or um, Milgram were the only uh, mathematics or English language arts members on the validation committee. Mathematics validation had at least either seven or nine members. The rest of them all agreed. Same. Same thing for the English language arts. Um, people are going to have a difference of opinion. Um, in terms of community college versus whatever, that goes back to um, the people who were on the development committees of the standard. Like I mentioned earlier, that included members from Harvard University, some of the really highly ranked universities, and they all agreed that these are college ready standards. So, I mean, that's right there. If, if a professor at Harvard is saying, yes, this would get you through your first year at Harvard, that you are well for, for your education here, I think that speaks volumes about the quality of the standards. Again, thank you all for coming this after this morning, and we appreciate your time. And the only comment I want to share on the on, in closing, we've heard a lot of interesting questions and still a lot of questions that we need to have dialogue about and sharing information. We wanted to give you the local understanding and how we are operating here locally. We have outstanding teachers in Lake County who are very committed to our students and want to focus on rigorous education and quality education. The conversation needs to be different with our students. We need to shift to a student ownership in their learning process that is rigorous, engaging, and project-based and inquiry-based, and we need to stop having the pressure put on them of testing, testing, testing. It's about learning, learning, learning. And again, thank you so much for coming, and we will continue to have this dialogue. Have a great day.